I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah, I just knew I was going to be talking to you, didn't I? You did. You, it, it always happens. There's no doubt about it. I predicted it. Um, I'm not out of the country, though. I'm still in this sodden turf of ours. Yes. And I've been filming and it's been a horrendously bad day. But So we're back in, in a hotel. So it's grand and able to talk to you. But look, this Revel News story is quite significant. And it's it's just an extraordinary state of affairs, really. Yeah, it is. It's it's really unusual. Um, obviously, the the... It's to do with a, a, a drugs investigation into organized crime. Um, what seems to have happened is with any of with any investigation into organized crime, often revenue and the Gardaí are involved in at, at both levels, uh, particularly involving the importation of drugs or the suspicion of it, the importation of drugs. Um, and obviously they work together really, really closely and that close uh intertwined relationship is hugely important for the the functioning of 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 anti-crime the branch of the state so what's happened here is there was a a operation centered on a gang who are a kind of a spanish moldovan outfit who have uh joined together with a very well-known irish gang that people we've been writing about for years who are known to be uh big dealers in cocaine and in weapons and there was a number of searches done. There was more than a million euro worth of cocaine caught. And during the searches, one of the houses targeted, uh, it was discovered that a revenue officer was living there, a female officer, who has full access to revenue files. And we'll come back to what sort of stuff is on revenue files, I suppose, in a minute. But um, that was last month and over a month ago, actually, now. And the house that in which this individual was living was searched and some a quantity of what is believed to be cocaine is still being um, examined by forensic science lab in Ireland and uh, a quantity of cash was seized. Also, a laptop and a phone, uh, a work phone, I believe, was seized and is being examined at the moment as well. And this individual is suspected of being part of this wider network. Obviously, you know, raids and when police move in, when Guardi move in on somebody, they're probably targeting key individuals. But there's also sort of all those other roles in the outskirts of a gang that are very significant. So this particular individual, this revenue officer, is under investigation and has been for a month. Yeah. Immediately those raids happened. The Guardi did inform revenue um, of this bizarre set of circumstances. And I guess they expected the person to be suspended, perhaps pending the investigation, the outcome of it, or certainly they expected that, you know, any access the individual has to the revenue files would be uh, removed with immediate effect. But that doesn't seem to be the case. No, I mean, obviously this person, uh, this revenue officer has not been charged with any, any crime, certainly not been found guilty of anything yet. However, that doesn't always mean that the the you wouldn't expect something to happen in the meantime anyway. You know, organizations, not least even big companies, can often suspend people without prejudice, I suppose, where you're saying, look, we're not saying you're guilty of anything. However, in the meantime, while this investigation goes on, you're stood down on gardening leave. Obviously, for the people themselves, that can be sort of traumatic or whatever. But, you know, that that when it comes to certain issues, you know, it's not that important. But obviously, the operation of, of, of a gang like this, you would expect instant action to be taken. Um, and, you know, whatever about people's employment rights, which have to be taken seriously, or their, their right to be presumed innocent, which is maybe not affected, you still would understand that that has to be balanced against you know the security of the state effectively literally the security of the state and every individual in it because of course revenue holds 
more information really than any other arm of the state. It holds more information than the Garda Shia Kona's bulk system because like realistically you're only on the Garda system if you've probably committed or suspect of committing a crime. Like ordinary individuals who are not involved in criminality at all are not on the Garda system. And, you know, that's when the Garda have to go to revenue to try and find out the details about these people. So revenue hold our PPS numbers. They have our addresses. They have our family history, don't they? They know who our dependents yeah. are. They know yeah. how much I'll, tax you're paying. Which tax you're paying, your circumstances. And if you owe any tax, you know, if you've got any outstanding tax, they hold a wealth of information on every single individual in this state. Yeah, I mean, ironically, on on um, today, like there's a guy who's come before the courts in in a Wicklow man, um, who's pled guilty to misuse basically of of pulse records from from a guardie. He was mm-hmm. being leaked pulse records by a civilian guard a worker, and while well, he wasn't sentenced, they had a sentencing hearing, and it was explained that he could get up to ten years for that. So there's a huge is. And they're caught basically because this civilian uh, guard worker who's also been, been prosecuted and uh, successfully, there's a record of everything that they look up on Pulse. There's a name in the time that they looked at it, um, you know, and then as we all know, then the guards can look back and say, why did you look this up? And, you know, so what goes on in revenue is the same thing there. I don't think we know uh, we don't because, I mean, there is so much accountability within the guards. And of course, there are so many guardy suspended at the moment pending the outcome of investigation. Yeah. And it's over 100, isn't there? And think... the outcome of investigations by GSOC as well as by their own. Yeah. Now, there may well be uh, similar things in, 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 in revenue. There may be a similar check system. But certainly uh, the level of there's been a huge number of prosecutions this year alone for people uh, what is actually described as corruptly accessing Pulse. I don't know, haven't seen at the same level of prosecutions in revenue. That's not to say there haven't been some. Have you seen that. any coming across your desk? Well, I haven't been on the same regularity now. Look, everything is different. Uh, and, and of course, we're not saying that this person has, this, this person that's under suspicion has done anything of the sort. We're merely pointing out are the same level of scrutiny going into the revenue systems as in the guard of pulse system, and that's something that is is you know maybe this is has brought up again. We don't know. You know. You'd have to wonder as well, really, in revenue, given the kind of information that they're handling and they have access to, is there a vetting system for people who are to be employed? But, is there any kind of a system in place where they are heavily vetted? Because they probably should be when you think yeah. of, of 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 what they have to hand. Well, we did put some of this stuff to revenue and they did come back with a statement, um, you know, saying that everybody is vetted to to a high degree working in revenue. And um, obviously there is no organization can be perfect. People can get in or give false information. Um, but, you know, certainly uh, with the Gardaí, there is ongoing checks. Uh, once somebody is in, they still check. And it's been something very controversial because obviously, you know, you can know people in your personal life. You can have people related to you that you mm-hmm. um, become involved in criminality, and it's you know that's not your fault. You can't be held responsible for the sins of others. But th- I do know with the guards, and there's been some controversial cases where people have ended up being suspended merely for knowing uh, somebody involved in criminality. So it's an interesting case, I suppose. The one of the more stark bits is you know what you've reported in terms of what sources are saying and that. That relationship is between revenue and um, certainly the organised crime uh, bureau and the criminal assets bureau, because many people don't understand is that there's a huge amount of sharing of information between these three arms of the state. Paul and the criminal assets bureau is actually an independent entity. It's not actually sort of governed within the uh, guardship. Obviously, the guard is drug and organised crime bureau is. It's a unit of the guards. It's the highest really crime fighting unit of the guards that's out there. I know that their top targets are mostly nearly operating out of the state these days uh, and you know what I mean they're trying to ultimately target what's on the ground here. They would have been one of the units that could have 
very much done a lot of work with that Encro chat information, which was never passed on to them because John O'Driscoll, the former assistant commissioner, now retired, who was in charge of that unit, has confirmed that none of that Encro chat uh, investigation files passed his desk while he was in position there. Um, and they really would have done the same work probably as we see elsewhere with that. And, and I bring that up because I think it's interesting that I think the Encro chat window into organised crime very much showed internationally the kind of infiltration that organised crime gangs now have into all areas of society. Um, I was telling you that Yaris van der Rohe, our colleague in Antwerp, had been sitting in a court case in Antwerp and one of the Encro chat cases came up. They're very much coming before the courts there a lot of the time and the Sky ECC hack cases. And the case was basically, his name was actually read out during the course of the evidence. He sort of whipped his head up to listen to him from another journalist. But this criminal gang had been uncovered by the Encro chat investigation. They had stepped away from criminality as such and had basically specialised in gathering information on other people. And they had collated files on journalists, on police, on lawyers, on anybody of interest to criminal gangs, court workers, airport workers, all of this. And they were able to give them information about who owed what kind of money, you know, what maybe habits they had, if they'd any bad ones, if they were suspected of having cocaine habits, gambling habits, whatever. And... The reason being that criminal gangs want people in ordinary society on their books. They want information. They want to be able to move their drugs through courts without them being searched. And they need people in ordinary jobs on their side for that. Um, and information is now very valuable. It's a very valuable product. So that is an eye-opener, I think, the value of information. And probably, and while I'm not saying that this individual under uh, in question that's working in revenue and is now part of um, a wider investigation by Gardaí into a, a drugs network. You can see where somebody could have the ability to access an awful lot of useful information to a criminal guy through a, 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 a you know through a, a place like revenue. Yeah, and of course you can see why the Gardaí, while accepting that everybody's innocent until proven guilty, would want. Uh, the strictest kind of, uh, you know, f for that to be in the clear before they take any further action. Um, it's a very, uh, you know, it's a very, you know, it's a very, uh, that sounds like a very tense situation where you need all these bodies of, of the bod arms of the law to be working together. Um, and yeah. like that, I, I've never heard of something like that where you have different branches of the state developing that level of distrust between each other. And actually, I started off to tell you something there went on a bit of a different tangent. But what I had started off to say was that, of course, the Criminal Assets Bureau swap information with Revenue Garda yeah. Shikona, the, the, the Drugs and Organised Crime Bureau swap information. They swap information, I believe, on live investigations. So they actually can often be giving information to Revenue before they kind of show their hand. Yeah, I mean, obviously... Very regularly, even in some of the investigations abroad, even most recently, I think there was an investigation into the Barry Young gang, and I think they had a revenue officer there at the same time as Cab. So they normally even go on the reins together. Um, and obviously then the, the revenue customs look after nearly all the, the, the arrests and seizures at Dublin's ports. I mean, that would be a particular, you know, that would be a, Many of them would be centrally involved in that. So it is a very uh, tense thing. I'll, I'll, we put some of the questions to Revenue. I'll just give you um, a response. On, 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 I'll just mm. read out the response. Um, they said Revenue are not in a position to comment on any operations or ongoing investigations carried out by Angarda Sheikana. Revenue staff are subject to security clearance and Garda vetting processes prior to commencing their employment with Revenue and Revenue and Ant and um, Garda Shiakana enjoy an excellent working relationship. So that that is mm -hmm. what they gave back to us. It's probably not unexpected that they wouldn't get into very specific uh, stuff, but nevertheless, that's uh, the response. But we may go back with a further detailed questions, I think, at a later point. Um, the Minister for Justice, Helen McAtee, has actually requested 
a personal briefing on this uh, from Drew Harris, the Garda Commissioner. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's very important. I think these are probably things that will be ironed out. Um, but it, I suppose the fact that it's going to that level, which not necessarily a lot within the Garda does go to that level. I mean, obviously we saw Helen McEntee uh, outside our workplace last week when big things happen, like, you know, obviously the attack on Talbot Street on an American tourist, obviously Helen McEntee is then becomes involved, but a lot of the kind of the ins and outs of the criminal justice system obviously wouldn't cross our desk. So it does show that it's been taken very seriously and it is a very serious matter. I mean, if you look at, you're talking about the Criminal Assets Bureau, I mean, a lot of their convictions, or not their convictions, their their successful operations, really involve, uh, you know, uh, people not paying tax. It doesn't even necessarily get proven to be the proceeds of crime. And not all of that comes from the fact that they interact with revenue, revenue, you know, show what somebody paid. All of And all of those cases have to be, I presume, warrants or at least court orders to get that pr- private data. So it's really, they work hand in hand and glove the whole time. Um, so yeah, it's not something that could be allowed to go on for too much longer. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it should have been allowed to go on for any length of time, really. When you look at the goal, and we, of course, know people behind the uh, this case, like we know who it is that's being targeted. We're not going to name anybody. Uh, there's somebody before the courts on serious organised crime charges. What we do know is that this guy are a mega international, this is full-blown international crime gang, that they are a target, not just of the Garda Shoot Capone here in Ireland, but they're a target of Europe. Both. They're a top target of uh, of Europe. Both. They're based in Spain, but they have cell-like structures in, in other territories. And it appears that that's what they have developed here in, in Ireland, a kind of a cell structure that's feeding into their main base in Spain, but that has kind of coupled up, cooperated with a significant Irish mob and they've been bringing in a lot of drugs, a lot of cocaine. It's suspected they've been using the equestrian industry to move uh, cocaine. They've been specially adapting um, some transport units to bring cocaine in. Of course, we've seen that, you know, before. But always in sort of major criminality is when you when you see that kind of adaptation of actual uh, transportation for for that purpose. Yeah, it seems like these these are one of this is one of the networks that has grown stronger in the sort of demise of some of the Kenyan cartel because some of these gangs obviously that were based that are Irish uh, based would have previously dealt with the Kenyans, but they seem to now have this other networks are starting to get stronger and these seem to be one of them. Uh, in particular, you know, not that we can go into a great deal of the detail about it, but yeah, it's it's they they are they do seem to be a prime target across Europe. And again, you're seeing the sort of international police force aspect to it. And, uh, you know, nobody would want to see Ireland put that at risk. And, you know, governance is so important when you're you're looking at the threat of organised crime and even down to the threat of street level crime. I mean, what has happened around Talbot Street? Because I have to say, before this attack on this gentleman, this American gentleman, and I had said it to you a few times, it just feels very unsafe around there. And that's really the first time, I think, in years that, I mean, we're always out and about uh, Talbot Street. Our offices are there. We're in and out of the building. Um, we know what it is. It is what it is. You know that you're not going to just sort of, you know, float around Talbot Street and that general area without keeping your wits about you. But there's been a more kind of feeling of zero presence of Gardaí on the street. It feels like any of that community guard are, presence is is gone and um, you know is it obviously the focus of that is surely the management of that area of Dublin the garden management of it yeah I mean uh, look nobody is saying that it's you know extra guards on the beach is going to solve all of the problems that you see on Talbot Street where we like we work every day um, for many years too many to mention but it has deteriorated. Like it's worse than you know than it was before, and it certainly got worse during the lockdown. Uh, funnily enough, because we were still in the offices, having uh, you know we were journalism continued in the offices uh, despite the lockdown. And um, I don't know. I mean, it's it's you know people suffer from addiction. They're ill and they're not well, and nobody wants to you know put them down or slag them off or make a joke of it. 
but it's something that's going on on Albert Street. It is, it is, uh, you know, it's not right. Um, and yeah, it it does seem that um, it's kind of been let slide, has it? It's been yeah, kind that's of a what bit it of a bit, like. a bit written off, like you know what I mean. That I that's think the... every area has its own particular needs when it comes to policing, and it's not just one thing that fits all. And the area, and of course, it's Store Street that's in charge of the area. And there's really good people working in Store Street. There always has been. Um, there's always been a big connection with the locality. I mean, I've known guards there for years who are able to tell you exactly who's who walking down the street because they know their mothers, they know the grannies, maybe they know the aunties, they know their own community. But that's really, I think, what has always been something that has, has really well, been special in that particular part of Dublin and is that being encouraged under whatever management is there at the moment or is it you know as that being are people being kept in the offices at their desk well, the few, but they really should be out in those streets well look I mean again you can say it's an easy solution but all of the guards if you talk to them that are working in the city centre they all give out universally I mean these are talk these are like less not top level management guards but they all give out about the level of paperwork don't they that they have to, they do yeah yeah and yeah. That they say that everything has to be recorded in a certain way that's what they spend their work and they do and that that has been a massive change over the last few years like nobody probably likes paperwork and all that and maybe paperwork has to be done but they all universally say that that has become a huge part of their job a hugely time consuming part of their job and I mean obviously Store Street, if you're doing that, if that many man hours are going into paperwork, it's not going into the basics, which is walking around and, and stopping people. And look, it's chaos, it's chaos yeah. out there and it doesn't do anybody any good, you know? No, but I suppose the thing about the guards is it's such a, you know, it's, it, you do what you're told. You're, 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 you know, it's, it's structured in such a way that it's not like you kind of go in every day to do whatever the hell you want. So no. somebody is in charge of where people are where they are and how policing is handled on a day-to-day basis. And, you know, really, I suppose, um, you'd have to look at the guys in charge of that station and ask them, or the women, and ask yeah. them, in the name of God, what has happened over the last couple of years. Because yeah, things have definitely changed. I mean, we're as local now as, as anybody, you know. Yeah. Actually, been living in the bloody office some days, but you know what I mean. You do feel you, you know the place, and you can yeah. see the change. You can feel it. Yeah, it definitely deteriorated over the lockdown, um, mm-hmm. and obviously, you know, some of the, the the tourism that was there. I know this is a tourist in this case, a very tragic uh, incident, but some of the tourism has it's gone, like you know, and it's just been replaced. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's if there's limited resources in the Gardaí, but are they? Are those limited resources being directed in the right way? A lot of the guys, the guards on the beach, they'd all tell you it's not. Um, yeah, yeah. Anyway. anyway, look, Helen McEntee is is sort of multitasking there at the moment, but uh, we'll come back to this revenue story later in the week um, because we want to see how it develops and uh, we'll talk maybe a bit more about the gang at the centre of this because the focus really is and should be for the moment on the problems between revenue and the Gardaí and that sort of uh, stalemate that now is probably going to need some political will to break in whatever way and also see if revenue, you know, if, if their statements that they gave you was okay or if there's further questions for them to answer in, in yeah. their actions. So listen, I'll talk to you later in the week um, and in the meantime, stay dry. I'm trying to myself. Please God, it'll stop raining tomorrow. Yes, but hopefully Nicola, you'll survive. Yeah, yeah. Been... and survive anyway, and survive worse. Yeah, all right. I tell you later in the week. Thank you.